Hi, everybody out there. Uh, my name is Glenn Helfand. I'm a Oakland-based art critic and curator and teacher. Um, I'm here at the Headlands today to introduce you to Tom Colford. And uh, I think we wish you were all here. It's a beautiful day in Marin. Um, the sun's out. And I think that that's a pretty um, strong part of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, Tom Colford is the just finished up the 21-22 the Turnisall residency, and this, what we're going to see today, is the fruits of a, a year-long stay here. I'll let you either, you want to sure. say anything? Sure, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Daniel, and everyone at Headlands for making this possible. Uh, my experience here was phenomenal, um, and this has been a really fruitful exhibition for me. Um, uh, I'm going to refer to a lot of things Glenn and I have talked about before, um, before the live uh, feed, but this is all 95% uh, of the work that we have here was created while during my residency here, and then there's about 65 pieces in it in total. So we're going to talk about at least a few of them, right? Yeah. And then see how it goes. And yeah. then if anyone has any questions, please just do whatever you got to do to so Daniel knows, you know, make a comment or something. Um, so I'm pretty much here to facilitate this. We met, our, I guess, late spring. Uh, and I, I think I would want to start with that, that first meeting, which was me coming to the headlands and, and Tom was painting plain air overlooking the, the kind of valley towards the, the beach here. And I, I was really struck by that as a, a, a kind of practice that I, I don't see that often and just feels so kind of painterly. And I think also so much about being with the land. And I think what what's interesting today and in this show, and hopefully you'll come see on your own in person, is that merger of realism, plein air realism, and a kind of magic, so it, I don't I want to want to say surrealism and that just sort of gets attached, but I mean, there, there's a dreamy. It's a tricky word, yeah. Dreamy. Tricky word. And maybe you can talk about it. And I thought maybe we would start with this sure. painting, which is very much like a, a really interesting hybrid. Um, yeah, so this one is called Glimmer of Houses. Um, I discovered this location. It's, it's on the Headlands campus. It's just right up that hill over there. Um, I started out as a plein air painter 10, 12, 15 years ago whenever I started painting. Um, I'm originally from Indiana and I learned to paint at IU Bloomington. All my teachers were plein air painters. Um, and they sort of taught me how to see the magic that's in reality. Um, I think uh, generally speaking, plein air painting doesn't get a lot of attention always. I mean, it kind of seems like a Sunday painting kind of thing. And I kind of like want to elevate it a little bit by adding a little bit more um, realism to it, I suppose you could say. So with a lot of the plein air pieces I do, I return to the same subject. I mean, this one had 10 sessions in it. So I worked on it for maybe 30 hours over the course of about 10 different days. I would hike up there and return to the spot over and over and over again to get as much um, detail and um, interest as possible. I mean, I liked how these houses were kind of like peeking through the trees and how like almost each tree acts as like a border or maybe uh, a division between all these kind of different worlds that you can see in between the trees. Um, almost as if if you were driving by and you're looking out the car window and you're seeing all these flashes of imagery. Um, I'm kind of interested too in what painting does perceptually. I think it's like an inherently phenomenological experience or exercise. Um, and I like the idea of returning to the same spot over and over again, uh, not just to elevate um, the, the, the space of plein air painting, but also to kind of think about how uh, when we're stopping and looking, uh, we're seeing more. Um, and I think when we look once, we only get a certain percentage of information. Um, I think that's actually something called perceptual restoration, which sounds right to me, where a lot of the times our brain is making up the what. 50% of the information we're actually seeing. Uh, but when we return to the same location over and over again, we kind of experience more realism than we actually normally would. Um, so I've made a few pieces kind of similar to this, actually, I'm not, during my time here. I always kind of return to plein air painting just to 
um, kind of remind myself of the magic that's embedded in reality, which of course there's a lot of pieces of mine that um, without using the S word, um, do kind of play with uh, magical realist ideas or fantastical elements. They're very collaged to Curry Photoshop. I work in a range of different kinds of styles. So I return to this a lot to kind of keep myself grounded. Um, yeah. I think also this one, I really like the way that, you, you know, if you kind of like let your eyes sort of loosen or whatever you want to call that, it becomes a more abstract veil in front of that stuff. Like you stop seeing the, the buildings as the familiar headlands scenario. And, and it becomes like this kind of, you know, almost like fairy tale forest or a clearing or, you know, I don't like something sinister or positive could be happening back there. How much happened between, you know, how much work happens, you know, taking this inside after viewing it in situ? For this one, not, none. Um, it was 100% done up on that hill, um, which isn't always true. Sometimes I might like make a couple little edits here, but you know, that might be 2% of an entire painting. Yeah, this one was entirely done on site in the landscape, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, as were most of these actually. Yeah, we should move in. and But also just to point out to people that again, hopefully they can come see it, the, the relationship between the paintings and the actual sites are very visible in this particular exhibition. So let, let's go, sure, see the owl, which is right by the window. Um, so this one's called The View for the Cosmic Owl. Um, how did this one come about? Well, I had just gotten here last July or last August and uh, was kind of trying to figure out what exactly to do. So in my attempt to kind of like ground myself, I just started painting the view out the window, which also included the window. Um, I kind of just worked on it day by day from life, uh, layering on, learning how to paint shrubbery, kind of enjoying like all the little mark making that kind of like was present in just kind of like all the shrubbery and detail on the hill. Um, the term maximalist comes up a lot with this show for obvious mm -hmm. reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and now when I look at this one, I see that like, I do have this tendency to sort of like need, com I need complexity. I need a lot of these little marks and a lot of little action kind of things going on. Um, then, and then as I was kind of like getting closer to the finished state, there was this sort of like plastic owl sculpture that's kind of over by uh, over by where my studio was. And I just felt like it had been maybe watching me as I was making this painting and kind of figuring things out. So I decided to just take this little figurine and put it in and painted it. Um, I yeah. love the way that you have so much going on, you know, in terms of just the, the colors that are happening there. It's almost like, you know, these, these fireworks because mm -hmm. we're happening this mm -hmm. week. I mean, I guess maybe this does form a, a good segue to the to this painting here. Mm -hmm. The colors are similar, but the the quality of this painting is very different. And I guess this is this goes into that magic realm, I'd say. Oh, for sure. Yeah, this one um, is titled Grave of the Fireflies. And I actually, yeah, I have a lot to say about this piece. So. For a large portion of my work, I'm kind of designing the image on Photoshop, just using photos that I'm, I've been working from. I'm interested largely in uh, painting as a phenomenological exercise, but also just the subjectivity of our perceptions and how um, maybe the reality that you might construct in your head influences what you actually experience in your life, how you feel about it and uh, what you see, et cetera. Um, so a lot of my bigger pieces are these sort of like uh, a psychological space in the midst of being edited or um, changed as beliefs and ideas can morph over time and always eventually will. Anyways, this piece specifically, Grave of the Fireflies, I did take the title from the film, um, which is an anime from like 1988 or something. Um, it was a really affecting film to watch. It's really sad. So if you're going to see it, prepare yourself. Um, but I was really interested in the macro versus the micro with this one. And uh, I was reading about how astronauts experience this thing called the overview effect, where when they come back from outer space, they become more compassionate individuals because they see the Earth from such a great distance. 
Um, and they see this kind of like really beautiful little blue marble and then they return and they see that there's all this suffering up close. And I just thought that there was like a visual kind of synchronicity between how like a cosmic or like universal or like from a great distance you see all this beauty in the night sky and how like there's a, sort of a visual similarity between that and if you close up on just the ground. And I just think it's kind of profound how like this is also in that little dot there, just like way closed up. So it's kind of like uh, thinking a lot about that sort of like macro versus micro relationship um, and um, how there's like these tiny dramas that are like earth shattering for the individual up close, but from a great distance, it can seem just like a little blip. So, a question from the audience. Sure. And the ask her, just how you describe your work and landscape and sort of natural spaces Um, I do think about it a bit. Um, I, oh, yeah. So the question was, how do I think about my relationship to my work, the landscape and process in relation to climate crisis? Um, I admit that I try not to think about it quite a bit because it's upsetting. But I do think about sometimes how um, this is sort of, uh, I think a lot about how everything has a level of intelligence to it. A book I would recommend for anyone to read is called The Spell of the Sensuous by David Abram. That book changed a lot about how I think about uh, not only my mind, but like the, in, the environment that I inhabit and how there is a level of sentience or consciousness or inherent knowledge in everything that surrounds us. Um, so specifically climate, I, definitely it's happening, but I think what the way I want to talk about the landscape and the value of the environment is through the fact that I believe it has an inherent uh, like consciousness to it. And I think when I'm painting these kind of more magical landscapes, I kind of want you to like understand that or have that thought at least cross your mind. Good question. Yeah, there, I, and I, I could see that way that, again, the, I, I don't think of this as an ominous painting, but I mean, there, there is a chemicalness to the, the purple, which is something you do find in nature occasionally. The, the fluorescence of that green, which are fireflies, which, you know, are, well, okay, so I'm curious about location in that regard because we don't have fireflies here. Um, <laughs> I don't know if this painting is sort of stemming from here, but are you kind of conflating Indiana and Marin? Oh, always. I think even subconsciously, because I'm from Indiana, so I'm from a very like lush green uh, world. And then coming to California, I feel like I'm trying to always combine that with like the pastel that's kind of California. Um, the imagery from this uh, piece was mostly taken from Sutro Forest, which is like uh, such a strange little place to hike in the middle of San Francisco. And um, a lot of these kind of firefly effects um, are kind of we're kind of inspired by that film I was referencing earlier. The, the first couple of scenes in that movie are just the spirits of two children and like all these kind of fireflies floating around them, which I think kind of are meant to make you think of the soul of you know these beings or like the soul or like the inherent sentience of um, the land or what is surrounding or the environment. So I think, uh, yeah, they kind of function for me in that way and that they're sort of like evidence of life among this really rich terrain. Let's look. Let's look a look at this wall of, of smaller pieces because I think I know you've talked about mm -hmm. uh, orbits, and you know I, I think that this gives us an opportunity to to see the the different ways you're you're thinking about things. There's a lot of different things going on here that end up in the in the larger paintings. I guess, first off, how do you view the smaller works? And maybe if you can take us through a few of them to just say, you know, how they're part of your, your process. So I make a lot of different types of pieces because I feel like um, to remain true to myself as an artist, I have to honor at least some of the various thoughts and interests that I have. Like, I feel like if I stick to one thing, I can really easily become trapped in that one thing. Um, and I don't like the idea of that. So I think for a lot of these, it's a way to get out a lot of just interests and thought without having to necessarily commit to something larger, but they all end up kind of like piecing together. And then 
the fact that they all kind of have like similar narratives to me kind of makes me think that like I am kind of building up larger narratives for the larger pieces as they go. Although in a lot of the cases, I kind of find that sometimes some of these smaller pieces definitely have the same weight as something that's six by six feet. It just, you know, sometimes um, that's just kind of what happens, even if it's a painting that I make in one swipe. I think the thing that the little pieces are made to remind me of is that um, even if I'm spending six months on like the super realistic large painting, something I do in two hours can have equal value. <laughs> so the fact that I have a lot of these um, sort of like keeps that ego in check. Um, but specifically, I think a lot of like the plain air pieces uh, give me challenges of how to develop a composition, mix proper color. Uh, it's like a technical exercise a lot of the time for me to make this like space interesting and be able to communicate it on a six by six or eight by eight panel. And it's like, um, it's always kind of a challenge for me to get that through. A lot of the abstract pieces are um, kind of like my response to the various frustrations I have, or they're sort of semi inspired by stories I might hear, or it's sort of a way for me to like, uh, essentially use a visual form of automatic writing instead of like thinking that much about every decision I might make, because I tend to be a very methodical uh, creator, it challenges me to not think so much and just react to a shape or a mark that I put down, react to the next one, and then try to make it work from there, as opposed to like following um, something that I'm seeing visually. So yeah, there are exercises to, um, uh, it's an exercise for the mind and it's an exercise for the eye too. I'm curious about uh, this oh, pixelated yeah. <laughs> piece and, and the relationship to digital photography, digital mm -hmm. culture, even, you know, this is smaller, it's closer to iPhone size. Mm -hmm. um, we have talked about your interest in, you know, analog digital, mm -hmm. maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Sure, this little piece is called Splash. Um, it was uh, taken from a photo from um, a hike I went on and I initially wanted to make it look more realistic and then halfway through I kind of realized I had something really interesting in an abstract level. Um, so I am like this uh, very like serious like plein air paint from life kind of person but I can't deny the fact that I need photography to create a lot of the bigger more fantastic uh, pieces that I create. So why not investigate the digital um, more intensely with painting. And that's kind of how some of the pixel paintings came about. I've done maybe, you know, 10 or 12 of them or something. Um, but they are like sort of ways for me to sort of like close up and investigate the, the actual image that I'm working with because I'm constantly collaging on Photoshop. So sometimes I zoom in just to see all the little building blocks that create it um, and uh, try to highlight them because I think that they can sometimes be like very interesting spots on them and in themselves. Um, and then the process is kind of like totally different than my normal painting process. So it's another way for me to get out of my natural habits and kind of like refresh something. Um, I basically, I use a lot of technology to create it. So I'll like break down an image into several different layers and then I print off tons of stencils and then like um, glue them on, paint them. And I mix very, try to mix colors as accurately as I can from a computer screen, which is a very different process from mixing colors accurately from the landscape. Um, I just use completely different pigments. So it's another, it's another kind of like approach to painting um, that I feel like allows me to sort of like analyze the micro in relation to the micro, macro again. It's also a, a nice surprise to see a number of collages in the mm -hmm. exhibition, um, which again, if you come, you can see them in person. I, maybe There's we can use this one yeah. as an opportunity to tell us, I mean, do you use that as a, a means of a color study or how do they fit in? Uh, they fit in in a lot of different ways. I mean, I think that fundamentally I'm interested in shape and color, like with the pixel pieces, I think I kind of learned that about myself, that I am interested in like, uh, the subjectivity of light, like the specific things I'm painting, but largely the images function on a very like technical level. Like there's shape, there's line, there's color, there's value. And I don't necessarily need subject matter always to talk about what I might want to talk about. If indeed I even want to talk about anything, sometimes I just want to make stuff. And that's what a lot of these are. It's like my urge to make stuff without needing a whole lot of 
specific subject matter or conceptual baggage in order to like be able to walk into that space. I also just have so many like, um, I mean, I can almost tell you where a lot of these pieces came from. Like I just had all this kind of color aid paper sitting around. I have a lot of paintings on paper that failed and like didn't work for me or just experiments. I end up keeping them and I end up cutting them up just to kind of repurpose things and loosen up. Um, so yeah, it's like an automatic writing kind of thing where like I'll just cut shapes, cut random shapes that I find interesting, um, paste them on one at a time. I don't think a lot about it until I, I feel like I'm, I'm getting close to the finish, finish line. Um, yeah, it's just an exploration kind of. Do you view that as a landscape? This one, I view this one more as an interior landscape. For me, to me, it felt like very bodily. Like when I got to like 75% of it done, I felt like maybe I was um, uh, illustrating some sort of like abstract variation on like an, uh, internal organs or something. Like it felt mm -hmm. very much mm -hmm. like an interior, mm -hmm. like bodily kind of like, um, not necessarily like gory, but like, you know, it was, it felt very surgical to me. This one's called novel surgeries. So like, I felt like this slash yeah, okay. was like, um, sort of like an invasive element that was like trying to mend something that might not be going right within the stomach. Um, huh. and that, that's, that's just what the image told me when I finished mm -hmm. it too. I didn't have that intention necessarily. It just like the color palette and then the different shapes present in that one gave me that kind of like, kind of told me the answer. So in like an intestinal stream. Yeah, it's like it's sort of like an intestinal stream. Yeah, I've got a lot of weird little collages that are all kind of like all related to strange things. Like if you look at the titles, a lot of the pieces, it'll give you like a clue of kind of like how I interpreted it when I finished it. Um, but I kind of like I don't always like to point that out first off because I want people to kind of like see it and experience it for themselves. So that that's a great segue to, to talk mm -hmm. about the something that I really appreciate mm -hmm. about your work in terms of there being, you know, exterior and interior mm -hmm. and literally nature that comes inside. So mm -hmm. maybe this could be an opportunity to talk about this sure. painting or, you know, and the number of, I don't think there's so many here, but, you know, house plants or, you know, potted plants, that, that kind of merger of nature and culture. So this one, I total maximalism. Totally. Um, <laughs> yeah. I love the, the kind of timelessness. It's a, there's something a bit acid trippy about it, but also very architectural. Um, I think you mentioned that this is started off in your apartment building mm -hmm. where you live. I mean, maybe you can walk us through it. Sure. So uh, I think I mentioned it earlier, but a lot of the larger pieces that I created that are these sort of like Photoshop inspired um, they're all about like memories, beliefs, and ideas and how they can be sort of like edited or morphed throughout time. Like they're always kind of evolving. Um, so a lot of these are just, a lot of this imagery is like put together as a part of like a similar process. Um, it's sort of like a cycle, it's a psychological space that, um, is reflective of some of my own thoughts that kind of like doesn't necessarily make sense for one narrative, but like is a culmination of like a bunch of different thoughts and feelings that illustrate kind of, if I were to illustrate the uh, buzzing of thoughts in my head, it would look something like this is ultimately kind of what I'm doing. So it has a lot of imagery from places I find fascinating, like like all these, all the foliage from this piece comes from Sutra Forest, which is once again, a place I love to hike. And then uh, this is uh, the stairway from what my old apartment building. Um, and then uh, these, the eucalyptus are from headlands and then the windows in the background are from my home. Um, the chandelier is from, uh, 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 some, I think it's uh, Greenwood Cemetery in New York. I went into like a little mausoleum and found that chandelier and felt like it worked in there. And then um, I, in relation again to like my interest in sort of like non-human intelligence, um, I have like a lot of uh, interests in like UFO phenomena and like different gaps in our perceptions or like, um, and so I kind of got really interested in how like a lot of these things seem to be related um, or at least can be conflated when you're thinking about them because when you think about different things, they're all it kind of like equalizes everything as being um, it's kind of the same plane. Um, this piece specifically, it's called as above, so below, which is like a, a phrase that comes from old hermetic texts from like the eighth century, which isn't important, but it kind of became more popularized 
um, uh, with occultists in the like 19th and 20th centuries. But it essentially, essentially means that like the upper echelons of or planes of reality have similar um, uh, functions as like lower lower planes. So like if you think about like Greek or Roman god myths and how like they had these story dramatic tales of gods. Um, they were really just kind of like reflections of like dramas that regular people went through or um, or like when you're talking to like a person and you're just you're mostly when you're talking to someone you're listening to kind of what they're saying but if you close up in on their face there's all these pores and hair and skin and then there's also these also all these like very visceral systems that are making all of that possible but you don't necessarily think about that because you're focused on the conversation so I'm kind of interested in this like mathematical web that like is the function or the, the real low uh lowest level of our reality and how that system, the way it's functioning together is reflective of like larger systems that we think about. Um, so yeah, this one I, I has a lot of, I guess I could talk about it all day, maybe I won't, but <laughs> well, there's that, a lot of various yeah. things that I could go into. I would, I would, would like to hear a bit about the relationship to pattern and design and the way that say here, you know, the way nature has historically come into Carpets. I mean, this in a certain way is like uh, William Morris wallpaper that has kind of exploded oh, yeah. out. I'm also really intrigued by this, the the, the small kind of more um, I don't know, Neko colored shapes in there that are geometric. Mm -hmm. Is that something you think about, or what? Are there other kind of artistic uh, um, painter references that are happening here? Yeah, I think about um, relationships of pattern to nature a lot, actually. Um, I find patterns to be sort of like the abstract representation of nature. I think we find patterns really calming as people because they're like, it's, it's predictable. It's like a thing we can control. It's like a very human man-made thing. And juxtaposing it against like the true like chaos of nature, I think is kind of like fun for me. Um, it's sort of like a sobering reminder um, yeah, the chandelier is a bit mysterious. I was kind of interested in, uh, I was watching the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and I'm really, I love the scene at the end where, like, the way they communicate with the aliens is through, like, lights and sounds. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of thinking about that when I was designing this stained glass kind of thing and how there's, like, this, this ulterior way of communicating that, like, we wouldn't normally even think to do, but because there's this other form of life that's evolved in a different way, whether it's plants or rocks or whatever you know it communicates in its own certain kind of way and learning how to like recognize that is kind of like a really fascinating thing or at least speculating on it through the medium of painting is fun uh, that i can say for sure um i don't know did i, did I yeah no, that's question, interesting Glenn? yeah <laughs> that's that's interesting because i mean that definitely does become kind of like a, a ufo you know an art nouveau ufo <laughs> art nouveau ufo <laughs> title of my next rhyming, work rhyming rhyming um, yeah, also just, I'm, you know, looking at it here, like seeing this, oh yeah, you know, these, and the, the, the kind of, I guess, reflection in a, in mm -hmm. a kind of window that we're not necessarily seeing. Um, yeah, there's, as you said, a ton going on here. I, I also think it would be great. I mean, maybe moving on again to the, the differences. I just, I love the, the window and then the view. Maybe we can show people the, the view out the window and then the painting that clearly is from that space. And then, yeah, if there's anything, that, any work that you uh, feel like we should touch on. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think I would encourage people to come see it. I mean, it's open <laughs> for another week and a half or so. Well, uh, Headlands Open Studios is Sunday from noon to five, and that's always a good time. Um, Damon's going to make a bunch of macaroni and cheese. You know, I love the, I, lo I love the food here. Um, uh, you know, the, it's, it's fun to hike here. You don't have to just see art. There's like a lot to do around the Headlands area that's really beautiful. You come see my show. I'll be here to answer any kind of questions people might have. I just encourage people to come experience it, not just to see my show, but to experience Headlands itself. I think this show is about Headlands in a lot of ways. Like I took a lot of imagery from the world, from this place and like used this, this place to meditate a lot on where the work is going to um, for me, um, which was a really valuable um, kind of experience. 
And so, yeah, what, what's coming up? What happens next yeah. now that you, um, or what did this, where did this lead? Well, um, uh, my next show, which I guess it doesn't help to plug it because it's like 10 months away, but like, because <laughs> I, I want you to come to this one. I yeah. want you to go yeah, to the yeah. next one yet. Of course. Um, the next one's going to be next April at Glass Rice Gallery. Um, and I think one of the things I learned from this show is that there's a lot of these little ideas that I kind of want to extrapolate on a little bit more intensely. I'm not sure which ones yet. Uh, I'm still kind of like meditating on it, but uh, I will say that you'll probably see me in Golden Gate Park painting a lot because I live near there now and I'm enjoying walking around there and it's really close to my house. And so I want to kind of continue exploring San Francisco through through plein air painting. I want to continue, I'm going to continue to make collages, but try to think about if I can make them bigger or if they have larger statements within them. Um, and then, yeah, I'm going to continue to kind of explore some of these same themes of perception and uh, phenomenology through the medium of painting and collage and just kind of see what happens. So um, it's going to be an, a really busy 10 months, I guess, actually, because I'm going to make a whole new body of work. But that's exciting. Definitely. Yeah, do we have uh, questions from anybody? Oh, uh, it's up until July 17th. This show is up until July 17th. Yeah, and I'll reiterate that it's a, a great show to see where the work came from. I think it really functions in a very special way. All right. Oh, yeah. All right. Nice seeing you all. <laughs> thanks for, thanks for uh, coming to see. I um, appreciate it. And thank you, Glenn. Thank you. This is great.